Revelation chapter 12 is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. Not only does it contain a vital part of the climax of the book of Revelation, a book that we're told was conveyed to John of Patmos by Jesus Christ himself, but it also conveys one of the most important doctrinal truths in the Bible. This truth concerns the conquering of Satan, that great dragon and deceiver of the world, and its message has massive implications for the life of every single follower of Jesus living today. But what is Revelation 12 trying to tell us? What message is it conveying to the church? What story is it narrating? And who is the woman featured in Revelation chapter 12? Is it Mary? Is it Israel? Is it the church? In this video, we will explain exactly what the Apostle John was narrating when he wrote down Revelation chapter 12. We will also explain exactly what the early church, the people to whom this book was originally written, understood about the correct interpretation of Revelation 12. And we will describe how the message of Revelation 12 directly impacts every single Christian living today. This is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. And if you haven't understood it up until now, prepare to get your world rocked. It's that good. Let us begin by placing this important chapter in its proper context. Thus far in the book of Revelation, We've witnessed a number of things take place. Plagues, judgments, natural disasters, and the coming of an Antichrist who is set on deceiving the people of the world into thinking that they can create sustainable peace themselves. We've also seen that throughout this period of great trouble, the church has been called to follow its Lord as a faithful witness amid a world running in a million different directions. As one scholar puts it, Revelation 12 begins a great digression. While Revelation 12 through 14 comprise the backbone of the book, Revelation 12 sets the stage for all the remaining chapters. The chapter begins with a sudden shift in scenery. We're told that a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. We're told that the woman was pregnant and was already crying out in birth pains. Suddenly, another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads, 10 horns, and seven crowns on its heads. We're told that the tail of the dragon swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth, and that the dragon stood before the woman ready to devour the child she was about to give birth to. The first thing we must remember when interpreting Revelation 12 is that these characters are symbols. How do we know this? because John states it explicitly in verse one. We're also told in verse nine exactly who the dragon represents. In this story, the dragon is the symbol for Satan, the ancient serpent and the deceiver of the whole world. But what do we make of the male child? Who exactly is this child? There should be no doubt that the child in this story represents Jesus Christ. After all, we're told in verse five that this child will rule the nations with a rod of iron and that the child was caught up to God and to his throne before the dragon could devour him. 
There is simply no one else whom this symbol could represent. This brings us to an interesting point in our discussion. Knowing that the woman in this story is pregnant with the Messiah Jesus and that the dragon is waiting to devour the child, doesn't Revelation 12 seem to be illustrating the story of Christ's birth? After all, we know that this lines up with history. When Jesus was born, Satan worked through Herod the Great, that evil king, to devour the child King Jesus. He did this by sending men to Bethlehem to slaughter all the male children in that region. All I can tell you at this point is that while John intends to recall these historical facts in your mind, this is not the whole story. There's still more here that needs to be explained and understood. In Revelation 12, after the child is born, he is immediately caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman, the child's mother, flees into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God to be protected from the dragon. But who exactly is this woman? If this were only a story about the birth of Christ, then it would be easy to interpret the woman as a symbol for the Virgin Mary. Many Christians today, mainly Roman Catholic, but some Protestant as well, still believe that the woman in this story is Mary. However, most scholars believe, and I happen to agree with them, that that could not be so. There are two main reasons why an interpretation that states that the woman in Revelation 12 is Mary falls short. The first is that the woman in this story remains on the earth throughout the 1,260 ensuing days, which here represent both a literal future time of great tribulation that will take place on the earth as well as the entire period of time between the first and second comings of Christ. There is nothing in the Bible which states that Mary would live on until the second coming of Christ. And church history teaches us that Mary likely accompanied John the Apostle, the author of Revelation, to Asia Minor, where she lived out her years as a faithful member of the local churches in that region. The second reason why the woman in this story couldn't possibly be Mary is that we are told in verse 17 that the woman has more offspring. And who are her offspring? Those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Since the woman in this story appears as the mother of those who keep the commandments of Jesus, does that mean that the woman represents the church? Or does she represent the nation of Israel, as some modern commentators have stated? Understanding the identity of the woman in Revelation 12 is crucial to understanding the message of the chapter. And her identity is revealed plainly when one reads the entire chapter the way it was designed to be read, as a singular, flowing narrative. The woman in Revelation chapter 12 does not represent Israel or the church. She represents both. The faithful remnant of believers from both the Old and New Covenant. This fits precisely with one of the major themes that we see throughout the book of Revelation, the coming together of Jews and Gentiles to form one new man in Christ Jesus. Is Mary included in this group? Absolutely. As is Joseph, her husband, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Ezra, Deborah, Daniel, Isaiah, Ruth, David, Tamar, and every single person from the beginning of time who has faithfully walked with God and kept his commandments. 
After all, it was the faithful remnant of saints within the nation of Israel that God worked in and through to bring forth his son. But the woman is not only represented by those faithful old covenant saints who brought forth their Messiah, but also by the remnant today, the church, those who follow the lamb and hold fast to his testimony despite the mounting pressure on us from the world to renounce him. You see, in Revelation 12, the woman not only brings forth the child, she also remains on the earth after he is caught up to God and to his throne. While the dragon continues to pursue her, he is unsuccessful at destroying the woman and chooses instead to make war on her offspring. In other words, even though the dragon is making war on God's church, he will never be successful in snuffing it out entirely. While the devil would love to destroy God's church, there will never be a time on earth prior to Christ's return when a faithful remnant will not exist. While the dragon may be permitted to successfully persecute some of her offspring, meaning individual Christians, he will never succeed in eliminating the remnant altogether. This leads us to our last and by far our most important point. If the woman in this story represents the faithful remnant of believers from both the Old and the New Testaments, a group that today comprises the Church of Jesus Christ, then is this story indeed only a story about the birth of Jesus Christ, as some have posited? Or is it about something that's gonna happen in the future? As one scholar puts it, while Revelation 12 masquerades as a birth narrative, it is not mainly the story of Christ's birth, but rather the story of his exaltation to the right hand of God Almighty. In other words, this story, while including snippets about his birth and his life on earth, is mainly about Christ's victory on the cross, his exaltation to the right hand of God, and his conquering of the great red dragon. To elucidate this point, allow us to take you back to a time before Jesus died when he was teaching in Jerusalem and preparing his own heart for what he was about to endure. He spoke to God and said, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. After saying these things, a voice responded to Jesus from heaven, the very voice of God, which said, I have glorified your name and I will glorify it again. As the crowd that was around looked on, amazed and wondering what had just happened, Jesus looked at them and spoke these words. This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Here is a record, one of several in the Gospels, where Jesus can be seen telling his disciples, as well as anyone else who cared to listen, exactly what would happen at the moment he entered heaven as the slain and resurrected Lamb of God. When Jesus placed his own blood on the mercy seat of heaven to make atonement for our sins, At that very moment, Michael the archangel was given authority over the dragon 
and the great accuser of the brethren was thrown out of heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, allow me to explain one thing. This is not a preterist reading of Revelation chapter 12. We do not believe that everything that is recorded in the book of Revelation has already taken place. However, the story contained in Revelation 12 has taken place, and it tells us exactly what happened when Jesus was caught up to God's throne having conquered sin and the dragon in order to show us exactly what happened to the dragon when the conquering king entered heaven as the slain and resurrected Lamb of God. You see, all through the Old Testament, Satan is seen as the great accuser of the brethren. His name, Satan in Hebrew, means accuser or adversary. In books like Job, Ezekiel, and Kings, we read that it is the role of the accuser to go before God and accuse God's people of sin and wrongdoing night and day. This is what the devil has been doing since the beginning of time. Since the moment he tricked Adam into eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when Christ entered heaven, a victorious conqueror, something about the devil's authority and his role drastically changed. Our Savior, the Advocate, entered heaven's court and threw your accuser out. How was he able to do this? by offering his own blood as the full payment for your sins and mine. Now that the penalty has been paid, the accuser no longer has the legal standing to enter heaven's court and accuse you and I of sin before our Father. The penalty has already been paid. All the dragon can do now, all he does do, and he does it with all his might, is try to trick believers into thinking that we are not who God says we are, that we have not been truly and completely redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Since the great deceiver has already been defeated and no longer has the ability to argue against your place amongst God's chosen, beloved remnant. His entire scheme is now built around deception, getting you to fold and to eliminate yourself from the great race, getting you to live in condemnation and in shame instead of in the glory of God's amazing grace. But take heart, Christian especially those of you who are still struggling to overcome sin. Because of what Christ did on the cross for you, by throwing your adversary out of heaven's court, you cannot lose your fight as long as you don't fold. Make no mistake about it. Revelation chapter 20 verse 2 has not taken place yet. The dragon has not yet been put completely in chains. The devil is still roaming about like a lion, seeking to deceive and devour people. But take heart. That great adversary has no legal position from which he can accuse you before your heavenly father. 
If you belong to Jesus, your record in God's court reads thus, righteous, made right by the blood of the lamb. Do not even entertain a thought from the accuser that your sin has not been covered. If you are in Christ, your sin has been covered. This is what Revelation 12 is all about. This is the story that John intended to tell when he wrote down this amazing chapter, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's the story of our conquering Savior, our great advocate, entering heaven's court after having overcome every temptation and every snare of the devil and stripping him of his position and power as the great accuser of the brethren. We now get the privilege of following the Lamb without fear of having our sins recommitted to our record. As long as we don't fold, as long as we hold fast to Jesus, our victory is guaranteed.